Hello, students. Um, we are continuing now with the presentation on Modular 2, Social Work, Past and Present. And uh, we're going to proceed now and uh, move into more of a historical perspective. And um, the place we're going to start is with what is referred to as the Elizabethan Poor Laws. So, Elizabethan poor laws really reflect all the way back to the 1600s in England. Um, and uh, I want to give you a bit of a perspective on how those uh, came about. Um, and then later on, we'll be talking about how those principles and um, uh, the way that um, the uh, community was um, managed um, transitioned from England over to the United States when immigration began to happen. So, um, as I said before, this is the role of English heritage in the US social welfare system. And to start off that in England, um, what you had was you had um, people who were suffering from poverty um, for a variety of reasons, obviously. When you think about anyone who's experiencing poverty, it's important to recognize that you could be looking at people who have physical disabilities, mental health disabilities, um, substance abuse. And obviously in the 1600s, those were probably not things that were being recognized. And so um, people were often treated as outcasts or less than um, simply because of the nature of the, um, the um, affiliation or the, the affliction, I'm sorry, that they were, they were experiencing. So, so in England at that time, if there was any charitable work that was being done or any support for these, um, these populations, it was often managed by the church. Um, and so um, there was a, a real sense that government didn't play a role and there wasn't any purpose for government to be playing a role. And so um, the church stepped in at that particular time and took over. What happened in England um, around that time was what is identified as the Industrial Revolution. And at that particular time, you saw a tremendous migration of um, people who were living in the rural uh, parts of the country moving into the city. You started to see more factory work and more um, production going on and people were looking for ways to be able to get jobs and make more money. However, the migration was so significant um, that there wasn't adequate housing or resources for these people who were relocating. And what you started to see was an increase in people who were experiencing homelessness um, and other um, issues. Local officials felt like they didn't have a way to be able to address that. And so they turned to parliament, which is um, comparable to our uh, Congress um, in England. Um, and um, Parliament at that particular time established the Elizabethan Poor Laws in 1601. So the Elizabethan Poor Laws delineated um, two particular categories, the way they organized people and broke them up. Um, there were the worthy poor and the unworthy poor. The worthy poor were individuals that were placed in what was called almshouses or poor houses. Um, this was a congregate living situation. Families were brought together. They weren't allowed to live in their own residence anymore. Uh, or if they didn't have a residence, obviously they were placed in a, a, a group or a congregate living facility. Quite frankly, often husbands and wives were separated. The men stayed in one part, the women stayed in the other part. Sometimes even children were separated from parents. So. Um, those that were considered worthy poor included the aged, chronically ill, individuals with disabilities, and orphan children. And again, these were um, folks who were placed in what is typically referred to as almshouses or poor houses. Um, and this was called indoor relief. Um, and the way I, I hope that you'll think about this is that um, you had to actually be a resident within the institution. You had to be inside the institution in order to be able to get the relief that you were looking for. Now, as opposed to worthy poor, then we had what were categorized as the unworthy poor. This was a category of what was seen as able-bodied individuals who um, were, uh, it was just assumed that they had a lack of motivation to secure gainful employment. 
Um, the situations for these individuals, as you might suspect, was even less humane. Uh, the treatment that they received was often um, designed specifically to um, discourage others from following in their footsteps. Um, they were um, sometimes placed in places like prisons, again, workhouses, um, and still others served as indentured servants in local factories or as slave laborers on local farms. So again, we have the unworthy poor and the worthy poor as two different categories. Now, what I might point out here is if you were able to identify that the worthy poor were often people who experienced physical disabilities, um, what about those that might have been, again, experiencing things like mental illness? Um, mental illness doesn't present itself as a physical disability, um, but it definitely is a disability that can prevent a person from being able to effectively work and be gainfully employed. So it's highly likely because we had such a poor understanding of the issue of mental health during that time that most folks who were experiencing mental illness would have been categorized as the unworthy poor. So um, social welfare in colonial America, what was the impact of the Elizabethan poor laws in US social welfare policy? Well, it, it played a, a significant role because basically Elizabethan poor laws was simply the, was transitioned from England to the United States once um, people began relocating um, to the United States. Um, it actually was the philosophy that drove all social service delivery systems um, until the Social Security Act was passed in 1935. Um, what it did do, what was positive, was it did demonstrate that the US government viewed itself as having a role or responsibility for the care and treatment of the poor. So now we're transitioning away from just the churches caring for people, but now we're starting to see that maybe government perceives that they have a role as well. Um, that the US government has the authority to force people to work and families to care for their dependents. And it'll be interesting, we'll see that pop back up as we start to look at some stuff in the 80s, uh, the 1980s. Um, and part of the law in the US included strict residency requirements which were enforced. Um, and again, as you know, that's um, something that's um, very prevalent in the way that we're delivering social services today in the United States. Um, so again, um, there was no particular formal government network for providing assistance to the poor. And so um, there was still a level of responsibility that was placed on religious organizations or by neighbors. Um, but many colonies passed laws that required new arrivals to demonstrate their ability to sustain themselves. They often had to identify local sponsors. So um, there was a, a real effort on the part of the federal government to be able to restrict or limit um, the number of people who would be coming into the country as new residents um, that were not able to identify that they were, they would be able to support themselves and their families upon their arrival. Um, again, something that um, sounds very similar to what we're hearing in terms of policy uh, today in the United States. Um, so the policy that guided social welfare in colonial America included support uh, for transients to be uh, sort of warned out, um, meaning um, uh, people could be um, deported and sent back to England. Um, and um, it also uh, recognized the fact that in colonial America, um, a lot of these folks became what were identified as indentured servants in the mid colonies or even slaves in the Southern colonies. So again, just to, I, I wanna make sure that we're, we're fully covering this because I do think it's very important, the difference between indoor relief and outdoor relief. Um, so again, poor law model, relief was either indoor um, or outdoor. Indoor meaning that you had to be within a workhouse or an almshouse in order to be able to receive relief. Outdoor meant that you were able to live in your own home and continue, and, and continue to operate in that home and still get relief there. So you did not need to be in a workhouse. Um, 
Colonial law often stressed initially indoor relief, um, which was again adopted from England. Um, and the truly poor, what we would identify as paupers, um, were often segregated within poor houses as punishment. Again, setting them up as examples for people um, who um, they felt may be at risk of becoming um, dependent uh, in terms of any kind of relief as a way to discourage that from happening. So after the American Revolution, uh, probably the most important shift during this period was the transition from indoor relief to outdoor relief, meaning that um, whatever assistance was being provided after the American Revolution, um, it was often provided um, with people residing in their own homes. Um, the East Coast um, of the United States was beginning to grow and cities were beginning to be established and you started to see this huge influx of immigrants that were arriving on a regular basis, often um, challenged in terms of finding jobs and often displaced at the beginning, um, um, not really uh, having um, a place to be able to live or stay upon their arrival. But that started to change. So what you also saw then were new organizations that became established to assist the urban poor. Um, and the first one I wanna to talk to you about is um, the New York Society for the Prevention of Pauperism. Uh, pauperism is a kind of a funny term that we really don't hear very much, but it would be um, aligned with um, people who are just living in poverty. So established in 1817, um, it actually divided the city into different districts, so different sections. Um, and created this friendly visitor program um, where people were, um, uh, individuals were visited and um, provided with information and assistance um, from somebody who was maybe, um, uh, uh, somebody who was familiar with the neighborhood and familiar with the community the individual they were visiting lived in. This obviously looks like an early version of social working and um, home visiting. In 1843, the Association for Improving the Conditions of the Poor was established in New York City. Um, the thing that was interesting about um, this particular organization was that they were the first to introduce the concept of conducting an assessment on what an, an individual or family needed prior to beginning to deliver service. So obviously assessment is a key component of everything that we do as social workers. So um, this was really the first organization that took a look at that as a um, strategy for being able to be effective and efficient. And then finally, the Charity Organization Society of Buffalo, New York was a private organization. So here we've got um, contributions that were coming from the community. <coughs> Excuse me. Founded by wealthy citizens. Um, and the Charity Organization Society sought to organize charities in an effort to prevent duplication of services and reduce dependency on charitable efforts. So um, towards the latter part of the 19th century, you started to see the states actually establish um, social welfare systems within each of the colonies or each of the states. And um, obviously this was um, as opposed to the federal government taking a role here. Um, they were looking at social service programs and charitable institutions and looking at an effective way to be able to deliver those and organize those in a way that worked best for the residents that lived in that particular state. Um, state charity uh, agencies were looking for uh, better quality of care and institutional, um, I'm sorry, better quality of care for institutional inmates. Um, so these would be either people who were incarcerated or people who may be, um, uh, mentally ill or even developmentally disabled. And with the federal government assuming only limited responsibility, state agencies became the primary public resource for addressing the problems of the poor and the infirmed. So one individual that um, we wanted to highlight was um, Dorothea Dix. Um, so she was, she had a particular interest in what we, uh, what was called at that particular time, the insane population, we would call them today, um, people who are suffering with mental illness. 
Um, she was um, a philanthropist, a social reformer. She came from a very well-known family. Um, she sought to convince um, President Pierce to provide federal funds to help support um, services to the mentally ill. Um, she was not successful in getting those um, funds raised, but she did do a lot of advocacy work, traveled throughout the United States, and really um, began to um, get uh, state, state groups to start to take a look at services for the mentally ill. Uh, Jane Adams, um, as you learn more about social work, you'll hear this name more frequently, um, was instrumental in creating the Settlement House Movement as a resource for preparing immigrants to live in a new society. So the Settlement House Movement was established in a number of different large communities, particularly on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, it was modeled after what was called Tomby Hall in London. Um, and in the United States, one of the most prominent um, settlement houses was Hull House, which was established in Chicago in 1889. Um, it tried to address all of the different issues that um, an immigrant or an immigrant family might be experiencing upon arriving in the United States, things like deficient housing, low wages, child labor, juvenile delinquency and disease, um, and really became major social action agencies within the United States. It's interesting to think about that as people immigrated and came into large cities in the United States during this time, um, they often were looking for um, people who had immigrated before them. And so you started to see these small communities within large, um, larger communities where you started to see a Chinatown or um, a whole pocket of people who were all originally from Italy who all um, had immigrated and now we're all residing in the same area. So the idea of establishing these um, settlement houses made a lot of sense because often the people that were within the neighborhood all spoke the same language, all had the same customs, all had the same traditions, and many of them um, were familiar with each other. So um, again, the settlement house movement was guided by a completely different set of principles. Here you're talking about not having a distinction between worthy and unworthy poor. Everyone was seen as normal. Um, the emphasis was on providing neighborhood services, community development, um, combining uh, individual achievement with satisf satisfying social relations and social responsibility, and really a holistic perspective, meaning that you were looking at the person as, as a whole. Um, you weren't looking at them just at their, at their disability, but you were looking at both their strengths as well as the challenges that they were experiencing. And both the Charity House Society, the COS, and the Settlement House Movement um, were really the precursors to um, some of the programs that you'll see today in modern or contemporary social work practice. Um, the Charity House Society Movement was really the forerunner for clinical social work where you're seeing people who are working one-on-one -on -one with um, clients. Um, and the Settlement House Movement was really the forerunner for non-clinical social work because it had such an emphasis on individuals as part of their community, social needs assessments, community organizing, social reform, political action, understanding and appreciating the strengths of cultural diversity and research on the community. So we're gonna take a break there and um, we'll pick it up with the next video. Um, and so please go ahead and progress through the rest of the modular um, for the um, pieces of the modular that comes next. Thanks.